Hello everyone, it's Mike DeMeo. I'm back. Uh, I haven't been making videos for YouTube for a few weeks, but I'm back tonight uh, to read passages from a book uh, for everyone. And tonight I will be reading passages from Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana who is the founder and abbot of the Bhavana Society in West Virginia. And he was also, uh, previously before Bhavana Society, he was the abbot of the Washington Buddhist Vihara, which is my main temple uh, in Washington, D.C. And so anyhow, Bhante Gunaratana has lived in the United States for several decades, and, you know, he is one of the pioneering monks of Theravada Buddhism in the United States and in, you know, uh, the greater uh, region of North America. So uh, this is his most famous and well-known book, Mindfulness in Plain English. And he, in this book, essentially uh, gives both seasoned and beginning meditators uh, tips uh, in, in plain English that they can use to overcome the problems in their meditation and, uh, you know, ways to establish a daily meditation practice and so on and so forth. So let's read some passages for mindfulness in plain English. And I'm going to mainly be reading uh, the section on dealing with problems. So I hope to read more sections of this book later on, but for now we're just going to read dealing with problems. So if you have this book on you, you can open it up uh, to chapter 10, which at least in the updated and expanded edition, should be on page 97. So it says, dealing with problems. You are going to run into problems in your meditation. Everybody does. Problems come in all shapes and sizes. And the only thing you can be absolutely certain about is that you will have some. The main trick in dealing with obstacles is to adopt the right attitude. Difficulties are an integral part of your practice. They aren't something to be avoided. They are to be used. They provide invaluable opportunities for learning. The reason we are all stuck in life's mud is that we ceaselessly run from our problems and after our desires. Uh, excuse me. The reason we are all stuck in life's mud is that we ceaselessly run from our problems and after our desires. So what he's saying is that, you know, people in life, we always uh, chase after our desires. You know, when we're dissatisfied with something and we want something else, we'll chase after that something else instead of learning to deal with our problems in life. And so when we practice meditation, that's a way of developing wisdom in regards to dealing with problems by, you know, sitting there and not moving when we have pain or you know, um, not, not like overdoing it, but, you know, at least making the effort to sit there and get through the pain. You know, it, it's teaching us how to deal with problems in life instead of trying to resist everything or run away from every problem we have. So, meditation provides us with a laboratory situation in which we can examine the syndrome and devise strategies for dealing with it. The various snags and hassles that arise during meditation are grist for the mill. They are the material with which we work. There is no pleasure without some degree of pain. There is no pain without some amount of pleasure. Life is composed of joys and miseries. They go hand in hand. Meditation is no exception. You will experience good times and bad times, ecstasies and fear. So don't be surprised when you hit some experience that feels like a brick wall. Don't think you are special. All seasoned meditators have had their own brick walls. They come up again and again. Just expect them and be ready to cope. Your ability to cope 
with trouble depends on your attitude. If you can learn to regard these hassles as opportunities, as chances, develop, as chances to develop in your practice, you'll make progress. Your ability to deal with some issue that arises in meditation will carry over into the rest of your life and allow you to smooth out big issues that really bother you. If you try to avoid each piece of nastiness that arises in meditation, you are reinforcing the habit that has already made life seem so unbearable at times. It is essential to learn to confront the less pleasant aspects of existence. Our job as meditators is to learn to be patient with ourselves and to see ourselves in an unbiased way, complete with all our sorrows and, inadequ and inadequacies. We have had to learn, excuse me, we have to learn to be kind to ourselves. In the long run, avoiding unpleasantness is a very unkind thing to do to yourself. Paradox, paradoxically, kindness entails confronting unpleasantness when it arises. One popular human strategy for dealing with difficulty is auto-suggestion. When something nasty pops up, you convince yourself it it is not there, or you convince yourself it is pleasant rather than unpleasant. The Buddha's tactic is quite the reverse. Rather than hide it or disguise it, the Buddha's teaching urges you to examine it to death. Buddhism advises you not to implant feelings you don't really have or to avoid feelings that you do have. If you are miserable, you are miserable. That is the reality. That is what is happening, so confront that. Look at square in the eye without flinching. When you are have, when you are having a bad time, examine that experience, observe it mindfully, study the phenomenon, and learn its mechanics. The way out of a trap is to study the trap itself, learn how it is built. You do this by taking the thing apart piece by piece. The trap can't, f the trap can't trap you if it has been taken to pieces. The result is freedom. The point is essential, but it is one of the least understood aspects of Buddhist philosophy. Those who have studied Buddhism superficially are quick to conclude that it is pessimistic, always harping on unpleasant things like suffering, always urging us to confront the uncomfortable realities of pain, death, and illness. Buddhist thinkers do not regard themselves as pessimists. Uh, quite, the op quite the opposite, actually. Pain exists in the universe. Some measure of it is unavoidable. Learning to deal with it is not pessimism, but a very pragmatic form of optimism. How would you deal with the death of your spouse? How would you feel if you lost your mother tomorrow, or your sister, or your closest friend? Suppose you lost your job, your savings, the use of your legs, all in the same day, could you face the prospect of spending the rest of your life in a wheelchair? How are you going to cope with the pain of terminal cancer if you contract it? And how will you deal with your own death when, it, when that approaches? You may escape most of these misfortunes, but you won't escape all of them. Most of us lose friends and relatives at some time during our lives. All of us get sick now and then, and all of us will die someday. You can suffer through those things like that you can excuse me you can suffer through things like that or you can face them openly the choice is yours pain is inevitable suffering is not pain and suffering are two different animals if you if any of these tragedies strike you in your present state of mind you will suffer the habit patterns that presently control your mind will lock you into that suffering and there will be no escape a bit of time spent Learn, in learning alternatives to those habit patterns is time well invested. Most human beings spend all their energies devising ways to increase their pleasure and decrease their pain. Buddhism does not advise that you cease this activity altogether. Money and security are fine. Pain should be avoided whenever possible. Nobody is telling you to give away every possession or seek out needless pain. But Buddhism does advise you to invest time and energy in learning to deal with unpleasantness because some pain is unavoidable. When you see a truck bearing down on you, by all means jump out of the way, but spend some time in meditation too, learning to deal with 
discomfort is the only way you'll be ready to handle the truck you didn't see. So let's turn to page, we're now on page 100. Problems will arise in your practice. Some of them will be physical, some of them will be emotional, and some will be attitudinal. All of them can be confronted and each has its own specific response. All of it, uh, excuse me, all of them are opportunities to free yourself. Problem one, physical pain. Nobody likes pain, yet everybody has some at one time or another. It is one of life's most common experiences and is bound to arise in your meditation in one form or another. Handling pain is a two-stage process. First, get rid of the pain if possible, or at least get rid of it as much as possible. Then, if some pain lingers, use it as an object of meditation. The first step is physical handling. Maybe the pain is an illness of sort or another, a headache, fever, bruises, or whatever. In this case, employ standard medical treatments before you sit down to meditate, take your medicine, apply your liniment, excuse me, I hope I said that right, apply your liniment, do whatever you ordinarily would do. Then there are certain part, excuse me, then there are certain pains that are specific to the seated posture. If you never spend much time sitting cross-legged on the floor, there will be an adjustment period. Some discomfort is nearly inevitable. According to where the pain is, there are specific remedies. If the pain is in the leg or knees, check your pants. If they are tight or made of thick material, that could be the problem. Try to change it. Check your cushion too. It could be about three inches in height when compressed. If the pain is around your waist, loose, try loosening your belt. Loosen the waistband of your pants if that is necessary. If you experience pain in your lower back, your posture is probably at fault. Slouching will never be comfortable, so straighten up. Don't be tight or rigid, but do keep your spine erect. Pain in the neck or upper back has several sources. The first is improper hand position. Your hands should be resting comfortably in your lap. Don't pull, excuse me, don't pull them up to your waist. Relax your arms and your neck muscles. Don't let your head droop forward. Keep it up and aligned with the rest of the spine. If you have made all these various adjustments, you may find that you still have some lingering pain. If that is the case, try step two. Make the pain your object of meditation. Don't jump up and don't get excited. Just observe the pain mindfully. When the pain becomes demanding, you will find it pulling your attention off the breath. Don't fight back. Just let your attention slide easily over onto the simple sensation. Go into the pain fully. Don't block the experience. Explore the feeling. Get beyond your avoiding reaction and go into the pure sensations that lie below that. You will discover that there are two things present. The first is the simple sensation, pain itself. Second is your resistance to that sensation and resistance reaction is, resistance reaction is partly mental and partly physical. The physical part consists of tensing the muscles in and around the painful area. Relax those muscles. Take them one by one and relax each one very thoroughly. This step alone will probably diminish the pain significantly. Then go after the mental side of the resistance. Just, are, just as you are tensing physically, you are also tensing psychologically. You are clamping down mentally on the sensation of pain trying to screen it off and reject it from consciousness the rejection is a wordless i don't like this feeling or go away attitude it is very subtle but it is there and you can find it if you really look locate it and relax that too the last part is more subtle there are really no human words to describe this action precisely the best way to get a handle on it is by analogy 
Examine what you did to those tight muscles and transfer that same action over to the mental sphere. Relax the mind in the same way you, that you would relax the body. Buddhism recognizes that the body and mind are tightly linked. This is so true that many people will not see this as a two-step procedure. For them to relax the body is to... Excuse me, for them to relax the body is to relax the mind and vice versa. These people will experience the entire relaxation, mental and physical, as a single process. In any case, just let go completely until your awareness slows down past that barrier of resistance and relaxes into the pure flowing sensation beneath. The resistance was a barrier that you yourself erected. It was a gap, a sense of distance between self and others. It was a borderline between me and the pain. Dissolve that barrier and separation vanishes. You slow down into the sea of surging sensation and you merge with the pain. You become the pain. You watch its ebb and flow and something surprising happens. It no longer hurts. Suffering is gone. Only the pain remains and experience nothing more. The me who was being hurt has gone. The result is freedom from pain. This is an incremental process. In the beginning, you can expect to succeed with small pains and be defeated by big ones. Like most of our skills, it grows with practice. The more you practice, the more pain you can handle. Please understand fully, there is no masochism being advocated here. Self-mortification is not the point. This is an exercise in awareness, not in self-torture. If the pain be becomes excruciating, go ahead and move, but move slowly and mindfully. Observe your movements. See how it feels to move. Watch what it does to the pain. Watch the pain diminish. Try not to move too much, though. The less you move, the easier it is to remain fully mindful. New meditators sometimes say, they have trouble remaining mindful when pain is present. This difficulty stems from misunderstanding. These students are conceiving mindfulness as something distinct from the experience of pain. It is not. Mindfulness never exists by itself. It always has some object and the object is as good at, and one object is as good as another. Pain is a mental state. You can be mindful of pain just as you are mindful of breathing. The rules we covered in chapter 4 apply to pain just as they apply to any other mental state. You must be careful not to reach beyond the sensation and not to fall short of it. Don't add anything to it and don't miss any part of it. Don't muddy the pure experience with concepts or pictures or discursive thinking. And keep your awareness right in the present time. Right with the pain so that you won't miss its beginning or its end. Pain not viewed in the clear light of mindfulness gives rise to emotional reactions like fear, anxiety, or anger. If it is properly viewed, we have no such reaction. It will be just sensation, just simple energy. Uh, once you have learned this technique with physical pain, then you can generalize it to the rest of your life. You can use it on, an, on any unpleasant situation. What works on pain will work on anxiety or chronic depression as well. This technique is one of life's most useful and ap applicable skills. It is patience. Okay, problem two, legs going to sleep. It is very common for beginners to have their legs fall asleep or go numb during meditation. They are simply not accustomed to the cross-legged posture. Some people get very anxious about this. They feel that they must get up and move around. A few are completely convinced that they will gangrene from lack of circulation. Numbness in the leg is nothing to worry about. It is caused by nerve pinch, not by lack of circulation. 
You can't damage the tissues of your legs by sitting, so relax. When your legs fall asleep in meditation, just mindfully observe the phenomenon. Examine what it feels like. It may be sort of uncomfortable, but it is not painful unless you tense up. Just stay calm and watch it. It, is, it does not matter if your legs go numb and stay that way for the whole period. After you have meditated for some time, that numbness will gradually disappear. Your body simply adjusts to the daily practice. Then you can sit for very long sessions with no numbness whatsoever. Okay, on to problem three. Problem three is odd sensations. And so it says people experience all manner of varied phenomena in meditation. Some people get itches, others feel tingling, deep relaxation, a feeling of lightness, or a floating sensation. You may f feel yourself growing or shrinking or rising up in the air. Beginners often get quite excited over such sensations. Don't worry, you are not likely to levitate anytime soon. As relaxation sets in, the nervous system simply begins to pass sensory signals more effectively. Large amounts of previously blocked sensory data can pour through, giving rise to all kinds of unique sensations. It does not signify anything in particular. It is just sensation. So simply employ the normal technique. Watch it come up and watch it pass away. Don't get involved. Problem four, drowsiness. It is quite common to experience drowsiness during meditation. You become very calm and relaxed. That is exactly what is supposed to happen. Unfortunately, we ordinarily experience this lovely state only when we are falling asleep and we associate it with that process. So naturally, you begin to drift off. When you find this happening, apply your mindfulness to the state of drowsiness itself. Drowsiness has certain definite characteristics. It does not, excuse me, it does certain things to your thought process. Find out what. It has certain bodily functions associated with it. Locate those. This inquisitive awareness is the direct opposite of drowsiness and will evaporate it. If it does not, then you should suspect physical you should suspect a physical cause of your sleepiness. Search that out and handle it. If you have just eaten a large meal, that could be the cause. It is best to eat lightly if you are about to meditate. I agree with that. Actually, um, my first, I would say, like, real uh, big retreat that I went on was at a local Burmese monastery um, called Mingalarama Vihara uh, near my home. And... Um, that was like my first real official meditation retreat that I went on. And uh, the monk that came um, was uh, named Shwayman One Sayada, and he is from Burma. He came from Burma to lead the retreat, and he um, was a disciple of Mahasi Sayada, so he taught the Mahasi Sayada technique, and that's what he was teaching us there at that retreat. And so anyhow, though, they gave us a lot of good food at the retreat. Um, Burmese food is also quite oily. It's good, but it's quite oily, like a lot of Southeast Asian food can be. And so, uh, one day I ate too much food and in the afternoon, it was also like warm. This is like in the middle of like June, I think, May or June. And so it was like quite warm outside and, um, you know, so I, I easily fell asleep one day after, after lunch. I ate too much and... I was like, I could not finish, uh, you know, I could not finish the, the, the rest of the retreat for, for that day because I was like too tired. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't focus. So yeah, um, I, I was just drowsy and falling asleep. So, so you know, I, I agree with what Bhante Gunaratana says here. You know, you, you want to, before you practice, uh, before you practice your meditation, <clears throat> excuse me, before you practice your meditation, you want to um, eat lightly and you don't want to eat too much uh, or anything that's like 
uh, high in carbs or oily or anything like that, like noodles or pasta or don't don't eat that stuff. Like eat something light, like a nice salad or or uh, some fruit or you know if or like you know if you're having breakfast, like oatmeal or something. Eat something where you can you know um, feel like kind of full, but but not you know like uh, not, not where you're falling asleep, you know, after you eat. So yeah, just, just eat enough. Don't, don't eat, don't eat anything that will, uh, cause you to fall asleep or feel too heavy afterwards. So it says, or wait an hour after a big meal and don't overlook the obvious either. If you have been hauling bricks all day, you're naturally going to be tired. Yeah, that's another thing is if you've been at work all day and you're just like moving things like, you know, your job is like really physical and everything, you're going to be too tired to like practice meditation at night when you get home. And so doing meditation in the morning is also something you should get into the habit of, you know, if you're like working really hard at your job and um, you're too tired when you get home. Uh, you know, you can also like drink tea if you're feeling too tired, um, that, that helps you, um, you know, that, that helps me wake up too, um, you know, it gives me enough energy to at least get through it, um, but, um, if you're doing like a really physical job, you may want to do your meditation in the morning, so, the same is true if you only got a few hours of sleep the night before. Take care of your body's physical needs, then meditate. Do not give in to sleepiness. Stay awake and mindful for sleep and meditative concentration are diametrically opposed experiences. You will not gain any new insight from sleep, but only for meditation. If you are very sleepy, then take a deep breath and hold it as long as you can. Then breathe out slowly. Take another deep breath again. Hold it in as long as you can. And breathe out slowly. Repeat this exercise until your body warms up and sleepiness fades away. Then return to your breath. Yeah, I find that like when I do meditation, excuse me, <clears throat> when I when I do meditation in the morning, it like wakes me up. Like if I'm drowsy in the morning and I do meditation, for some reason, it always wakes me up in the morning. Uh, but for me personally, I don't know about you guys, but but at night, like if I'm just really tired, I can't practice meditation. I I just can't do it. So un unless I have like tea or you know uh, caffeine of some kind, you know, just to to wake up a little. So yeah, definitely take care of your physical health. Uh, you know, um, I'm sure we've all experienced like our legs going to sleep. That happens quite often for most people. Uh, and then physical pain, that happened to me a lot when I was a beginner. But I think all beginners to meditation uh, experience a lot of physical pain. And then once your body gets used to it over time uh, with practice, um, you know, it gets a lot easier. Uh, so that's the, that's definitely true for me. I do not experience as much physical pain as I used to when I practice meditation. So, um, let's see here. Problem five, inability to concentrate. Yeah. You know, when you're a beginner, your mind is going to wander like crazy. Uh, that happened to me when I was a beginner. And I'm sure it's happened to all of you. I mean, it happens to me too every so often, but not as much as when I was a beginner. But for any of you guys who are like beginners to meditation or, you know, um, even more seasoned uh, meditation practitioners, uh, I I'm sure all of you, no matter uh, what your experience in meditation is, I I'm sure that you've all experienced your mind wandering. Uh, and, um, yeah, you know, that, that can be, that can be a big issue when you just cannot focus on your breath, uh, due to your mind wandering. 
And so it says here, an overactive jumping attention is something that everybody experiences from time to time. It is generally handled by the techniques presented in the chapter on distractions. You should also be informed, however, that there are certain external factors that contribute to this phenomenon, and these are best handled by simple adjustments in your schedule. Mental images are powerful entities. They can remain in the mind for long periods. All of the storytelling arts are direct manipulation of such material, and if the writer has done his job well, the characters and images presented will have a powerful and lingering effect on the mind. If you have been to the best movie of the year, the meditation that follows is going to be full of those images. If you are halfway through the scariest horror novel you ever read, your meditation is going to be full of monsters. So switch the order of events. Do your meditation first, then read or go to the movies. Uh, yeah, I personally don't really like um, watch movies all that much anymore. I, I do still watch documentaries. Um, you know, I don't personally watch like movies anymore that much um, or, or TV shows. I, I, like I said, I, I do watch documentaries, uh, non-fictional stuff. Um, but uh, it, you're not required to stop watching movies or TV shows to, to be a Buddhist or practice meditation. You can watch that stuff. I just personally found that it was, you know, um, too much of a distraction for me. Uh, you may not feel that way, so whatever you decide is, is, to do is your choice. It's, you're not, again, required to stop watching movies or TV shows to practice meditation or, or to be a Buddhist. But um, you do want to, uh, like like Bhante G is saying here, you do want to not like do those things before your meditation. Like do it after your meditation, just so those images and distractions don't get into your mind, uh, and and you know uh, cause your mind to wander everywhere um, when you're trying to focus on your breath and practice your meditation. So, uh, it says, another influential factor is your own emotional state. If there is some real conflict in your life, that agitation will carry over into meditation. Try to resolve your immediate daily conflicts before meditation when you can. Your life will run more smoothly, and you won't be pondering uselessly in your practice. But don't use this advice as a way to avoid... Don't use this advice as a way to avoid meditation. Sometimes you can't resolve every issue before you sit. Just go ahead and sit anyway. Use your meditation to let go of all the egocentric attitudes that keep you trapped within your own limited self-view. Your problems will resolve much more easily thereafter. And then there are those days when it seems that the mind will never rest, but you can't locate any apparent cause. Remember that this, remember the cyclic alternation we spoke of earlier. Meditation goes in cycles. You have good days and you have bad days. That is true. Um, Vipassana meditation is primarily an exercise in awareness. Emptying the mind is not as important as being mindful of what the mind is doing. If you are frantic and you can't do a thing to stop it. Just observe. It is all you. The result will be one more step forward in your journey of self-exploration. All, above all, don't get frustrated over the nonstop chatter of your mind. The babble is just one more thing to be mindful of. Yeah. Um, your mind, it just naturally thinks and, you know, um, has thoughts. Uh going through it so you're you're always going to be having thoughts and um it's just not letting those thoughts overwhelm you or uh distract you when you're practicing meditation uh you just don't want to get distracted by those thoughts you don't want to let your mind wander uh chasing after those thoughts you don't want to chase after those thoughts and let your mind wander
So uh, over time with practice, it gets a lot easier to just catch yourself when your mind is wandering. Uh, you know, when your mind begins to wander it, it, with practice and time, it just becomes easier to catch yourself when your mind starts to wander. So, um, just be patient, I would say. Uh, you know, Tani Sarobiku, also, you know, in my teacher, um, who, by the way, is a student of Tani Sarobiku, he's a lay person, but he's, he's a student of Tani Sarobiku. He and Tani Sarobiku have both have both said this too, is that, you know, the same thing that Bhante Gunaratana is saying here is that, you know, we're we're using meditation not as a means of running away from our problems, like trying to force our problems to go away or resist our problems. We're using it as a means to gain wisdom. So uh, you know, you, if, if you have like, let's say a distracting thought or, you know, you had something really bad happen to you and you're like obsessing about it, then, you know, you need to sit there and understand that what is going on is going on in your mind and you need to figure out why it's there. You know, what are you clinging to that is causing that uh, dissatisfaction in your mind, that suffering that you're having? You know, that obsession, that fear, that anxiety, that stress. What, what are you clinging to that is causing that to happen? Um... Or what are you craving for? It, it, it always boils down to craving, clinging, or attachment. Um, it, it's always one of those three things. Craving, clinging, or attachment. That's, that's the reason why um, you know, you're obsessing or anxious or stressed out or worried. Uh, so if you have like any of those issues when you're practicing meditation... You know, the point of meditation is, again, not to run away from those things, as Bhante Ji is saying here, and as Tani Sarabiku and my teacher have said too, and a lot of other teachers will say, is it, meditation is not about running away. You, you want to be away, excuse me, you want, you want to, it's not about running away. You want to be aware of the problem that's going on, and you want to, you, you want to use, you know, um, you, you want to use discernment to figure out why you're having that problem. You need to figure out what you are craving for or clinging or attached to that is causing uh, these uh, thoughts and emotions uh, to come up in your mind and disturb you. So, let's see here. Problem six. And, and once you figure out uh, one, once once you figure out what is um, what it is that you're craving for or clinging to, uh, you want to release it or let go. Uh, you know so and once you once you let go uh, of, of what you're craving for or clinging to, then that disturbance will go away. Like your mind, the, the tightness in your, your head will go away and you'll be able to return to your breath and uh, focus a lot more easily and, and concentrate. So, problem six, boredom. It is difficult to imagine anything more inherently boring than sitting still for an hour with nothing to do but feel the air going in and out of your nose. You're going to run into boredom repeatedly in your meditation. Everybody does. Boredom is a mental state and should be treated as such. A few simple strategies will help you to cope. Tactic A, reestablish true mindfulness. If the breath seems an exceedingly dull thing to observe over and over, you may rest assured of one thing. You have ceased to observe the process with true mindfulness. Mindfulness is never boring. Look again. Don't assume that you know what the breath is. Don't take it for granted that you have already seen everything there is to see. If you do, you are conceptualizing the process. 
You are not observing its living reality. When you are clearly mindful of the breath or of anything else, it is never boring. Mindfulness looks at everything with the eyes of a child with a sense of wonder. Mindfulness sees every moment as if it were the first and only moment in the universe. So look again. Tactic B. Observe your mental state. Look at, look at your state of boredom mindfully. What is boredom? Where is boredom? What does it feel like? What are its mental components? Does it have any physical feeling? Does, what does it do to your thought process? Take a fresh look at boredom as if you have never experienced that state before. Problem 7. Fear. States of fear sometimes arise during meditation for no discernible reason. It is a common phenomenon and there can be a number of causes. You may be experiencing the effect of something repressed long ago. Remember, thoughts arise first in the unconscious. The emotional context of a thought, the emotional contents of a thought complex often leak through into your conscious awareness long before the thought itself surfaces. If you sit through fear, the memory itself may bubble up to a point where you can endure it. Or you may be dealing directly with the fear that we all fear, fear of the unknown. At some point in your meditation career, you will be struck with the seriousness of what you are actually doing. You are tearing down the wall of illusion you have always used to explain life to yourself and shield yourself from the intense flame of reality. But you are about to meet ultimate truth face to face. That is scary, but it has to be dealt with eventually. Go ahead and dive right in. Yeah, again, you know, a lot of us fear the unknown and we just fear giving up our attachments, you know, uh, or giving up what's familiar. We fear giving up familiarity and that's really hard, you know, get, giving up what you've always been doing, the same routine every day, the same things every day for your whole life, you know, uh, at least, especially in regards to indulging in sensual pleasures like, um, you know, uh, drinking and, you know, using uh, drugs, you know, when you're stressed out or when you when you have issues that you're trying to escape from or run away from, uh, you know, when you're, um, you know, uh, Get, you know, giving up um, other sensual pleasures that, you know, uh, we've always, you know, uh, run to or gone to as a means to escape reality, um, you know, like sex and, you know, <clears throat> uh, dancing and, and, and loud music. And it's not that these things are bad or anything. It's just that you know, we use these things as, as a means of escaping what's going on, what's really going on in our mind, which is that we're suffering, you know, and that we have attachments and um, we have uh, these, these problems, these, these mental problems in our mind. And so we're using these sensual pleasures like sex and drugs and, you know, uh, dancing and loud music and... Um, you know, other things, uh, you know, eating good food, you know, all the time, like having these crazy um, sensory experiences with food and indulging in food, uh, you know, and just, just using it as a way to um, escape what's really going on in our mind. So again, Buddhism and meditation is, is about confronting the reality uh, which is that uh, we're suffering in life and that suffering is internal and it comes from the mind and that when we have these um, cravings and when we're clinging to things, we're, we're doing it because we don't want to give up what's familiar and we don't want to give up the same things that we've been doing our whole life. But in order to be happy, 
we need to give up what's familiar in order to um, experience the peace of Nibbana. We need to give up what is familiar because, again, we will see with our practice, um, you know, by gaining wisdom through our practice, we see that the familiar is what's keeping us suffering all the time. So uh, it's not that these activities are not fun or anything like uh, dancing and singing and loud music and drinking and drugs and, you know, sex and all that stuff. It's, it's not that it's not fun. Of course it's fun. It's not that it's, you know, bad or anything. It's, it's just, you can't, you can't do these things without suffering. You know, you can't um, live, uh, you know, you, you can't live, uh, how, how would you say, you can't, um, you, you can't cling to familiarity and you can't do the same things that you've been doing your whole life uh, if you want to end suffering. So, it's, it's important to understand that, you know, fear of the unknown mainly comes from, you know, just being afraid of giving up what's familiar uh, and, and, you know, changing our lifestyle so that we can have more wisdom and happiness and peace in our life. So, a third possibility is the fear that you are feeling may be self-generated. It may be arising out of unskillful concentration. You may have set uh, you may have set an unconscious program to examine what comes up. Thus, when a frightening fantasy arises, concentration locks onto it, and the fantasy feeds on the energy of your attention and grows. The real problem here is that mindfulness is weak. If mindfulness was strongly developed, it would notice the switch of attention as soon as it occurred and handle the situation in the usual manner, i.e identifying when this problem comes up and then letting go, you know, um, seeing it for how it is and, um, you know, not chasing after it, not chasing after this thought or fantasy and returning to the breath, just being aware that it's there and then returning to the breath. And so, uh, No matter what the source of your feel, no matter what the source of your fear, mindfulness is the cure. Observe the fear exactly as it is. Don't cling to it. Just watch it rising and growing. Study its effect. See how it makes you feel and how it affects your body. When you find yourself in the grip of horror fantasies, simply observe those mindfully. Watch the pictures as pictures. See memories as memories. Observe the emotional reactions that come along and know them for what they are. Stand aside from the process and don't get involved. Treat the whole dynamic as if you were a curious bystander. Most important, don't fight the situation. Don't try to repress the memories or the feelings or the fantasies. Just step out of the way and let the whole mess bubble up and flow past. It can't hurt you. It is just a memory. It is only a fantasy. It is nothing but fear. But when you let fear run its course in the arena of conscious attention, it won't sink back into the unconscious. It won't come back and it won't come back to haunt you later. It will be gone for good. So Problem eight, agitation. Restlessness is often a cover-up for some deeper experience taking place in the unconscious. We as humans are great at repressing things. Rather than confronting some unpleasant thought we experience, we try to bury it so we won't have to deal with the issue. Unfortunately, we usually don't succeed, at least not fully. We hide the thought, but the mental energy we use to cover it up sits there and boils. The result is that sense of unease that we call agitation or restlessness. There's nothing you can put your finger on, but you don't feel at ease. You can't relax. When this uncomfortable state arises in meditation, just observe it. Don't let it rule you. Don't jump up and run off, and don't struggle with it and try to make it go away. Just let it be there and watch it closely. 
then the repre then the repressed material will eventually surface and you will find out what you have been worrying about the unpleasant experience that you have been trying to avoid could be almost anything guilt greed or other problems it could be low-grade pain or subtle sickness or approaching illness whatever it is let it arise and look at it mindfully if you just sit still and observe your agitation it will eventually pass sitting through restlessness as a little breakthrough in your meditation career it will teach you a lot you will find that agitation is actually rather a superficial mental state it is inherently epimeral ep ephemeral excuse me it is inherently ephemeral it comes and goes it has no real grip on you at all <laughs> problem nine trying too hard advanced meditators are generally found to be pretty jovial people they possess one of the most valuable of all human treasures a sense of humor it is not the superficial witty repartee of the talk show host it is a real sense of humor they can laugh at their own human failures they can chuckle at personal disasters beginners in meditation are often too much serious for their own good it is important to loosen up it is important to learn to loosen up in your session to relax in your meditation you need to learn to watch objectively whatever happens. You can't do that if you're intense and striving, taking it also very, very seriously. New meditators are often overly eager for results. They are full of enormous and inflated expectations. Yeah, so many new people to meditation, like beginners to meditation, want to go on one retreat and become awakened, like overnight, like on one retreat. This is a lifetime path, and the vast majority of people will not become awakened in this lifetime, even if they're serious practitioners. Very, very few people will become fully awakened in this life. Um, but by undertaking this path for life and practicing meditation for the rest of your life, you can at least make some progress and become awakened um, in a near future lifetime. So... Um, and, you know, in the very least, uh, ease a lot of your suffering in, in this life. So, uh, they jump right in and expect incredible results in no time flat. They push, they tense, they sweat and strain, and it is also terribly, terribly grim and solemn. This state of tension is the antithesis of mindfulness. Naturally, they achieve little. Then they decide that this meditation is not so exciting after all. It did not give them what they wanted. They chuck it aside. It should be pointed out that you learn about meditation. Excuse me. It should be pointed out that you that you learn about meditation only by meditating. You learn what meditation is all about and where it leads only through direct experience of the thing itself. Therefore, the beginner does not know where he is headed because he has developed little sense of where his practice is leading. The novice's expectation is naturally unrealistic and uninformed. Newcomers to meditation expect all the wrong things, and those expectations do no good at all. They get in the way. Trying too hard leads to rigidity, excuse me, trying too hard leads to rigidity and unhappiness to guilt and self-condemnation. When you are trying too hard, your effort becomes mechanical and defeats mindfulness before it even gets started. You are well advised to drop all that. Drop your expectations and straining. Simply meditate with a steady and balanced effort. Enjoy your meditation and don't load yourself down with sweat and struggles. Just be mindful. The meditation itself will take care of the future. Discouragement. Uh, we're, we're on problem 10. So just to remind everyone, this is on page 110. Now we're on problem 10. So this is discouragement. The upshot of pushing too hard is frustration. You are in a state of tension. 
you get nowhere. You realize that you are not making the progress you expected, so don't get dis so you excuse me. You you realize you are not making the progress you expected, so you get discouraged. You feel like a failure. It is all a very natural cycle, but a totally avoidable one. Striving after unrealistic expectations is the source. Nevertheless, it is common it is a common enough syndrome, and in spite of all the best advice, you may find it happening to you. There is a solution. You find yourself discouraged, just, just observe your mind, excuse me, if you find yourself discouraged, just observe your mind, your state of mind clearly. Don't add anything to it, just watch it. A sense of failure is only another ep ephemeral emotional reaction. If you get involved, it feeds on your energy and it grows. If you simply stand aside and watch it, it passes away. If you are discouraged over your perceived failure in meditation, that is especially easy to deal with. You feel that you have failed in your practice. You have failed to be mindful. Simply become mindful of that sense of failure. You have just reestablished your mindfulness with that single step. The reason for your sense of failure is nothing but a memory. There is no such thing as failure in meditation. There are setbacks and difficulties, but there is no failure unless you give up entirely. Even if you have spent 20 solid years getting nowhere, you can be mindful at any second you choose. It is your decision. Regretting is only one more way of being unmindful. The instant that you realize that you have been unmindful, that realization itself is an act of mindfulness. So continue the process. Don't get sidetracked by an emotional reaction. So, problem 11. And we have a couple more problems to get through, but this is problem 11. Resistance to meditation. There are times when you don't feel like meditating. The very idea seems obnoxious. Missing a single practice session is scarcely important. But it very, it very easily becomes a habit. It is wiser to push on through the resistance. Go sit anyway. Observe this feeling of aversion. In most cases, it is a passing emotion, a flash in the pan that will evaporate in front of your eyes. Five minutes after you sit down, it is gone. In other cases, it is due to some sour mood that day, and it lasts longer. Still, it does pass. And it is better to get rid of it in your twenty or thirty minute. In, and it is better to get rid of it in twenty or thirty minutes of meditation than to carry around, carry it around with you and let it ruin the rest of your day. At other times, resistance may be due to some difficulty you are having with the practice itself. You may or may not know what that difficulty is. The problem is known. Handle it by one of the techniques given in this book. Once the problem is gone, the resistance will be gone. If the problem is unknown then you are going to have to tough it out. Just sit through the resistance and observe it mindfully. It will pass. Then the problem causing it will probably bubble up in its wake and you can deal with that. If resistance to meditation is a common feature of your practice, then you should suspect some subtle error in your basic attitude. Meditation is not a ritual conducted in a particular posture. It is not a painful exercise or period of enforced boredom. It is not a grim, solemn obligation. Meditation is mindfulness. It is a new way of seeing things and it is a form of play. Meditation is your friend. Come to regard it as such and resistance will disappear like smoke on a summer breeze. If you try all these possibilities and the resistance remains, then there may be a problem. Certain metaphysical snags that meditators sometimes encounter go beyond the scope of this book. It is not common for new meditators to hit these, but it can happen. Don't give up. Go and get help. Seek out qualified teachers of the Vipassana style of meditation Seek out qualified teachers of the Vipassana style of meditation and ask them 
to help you resolve the situation. Such people exist for exactly that purpose. So yeah, um, there are uh, many different styles of meditation. I just wanted to point this out. There are many different styles of meditation in Buddhism. Um, uh, vipassana is is um, just the term sometimes used for all of it, for all the teachers um, in meditation uh, or, or all the styles of meditation in Buddhism. Uh, sometimes it's just coined, all of it's sometimes just coined under the term vipassana. Uh, but there are different uh, kinds of meditation in Buddhism, and um, not all of them involve uh, vipassana uh, as as the central uh, technique. Uh, you know, vipassana is is insight as taught by the Buddha, but you know, vipassana as a technique is um, more so the Burmese style of of meditation. That's the they teach a type of meditation called vipassana meditation. So usually vipassana is the term, the broader term used for all meditation in in Buddhism, but it doesn't all involve vipassana as, you know, the main technique. So there are different techniques of meditation, but it's all, you know, um, called, uh, sometimes it's all called vipassana meditation. Uh, like it's all grouped together as vipassana meditation so i'm just pointing that out um so problem 12 stupor or dullness we have already discussed the sinking mind phenomenon but there is a special route to that state that you should watch out for mental dullness can result as an unwanted byproduct of deepening concentration as your relax as your relaxation as your relaxation deepens muscles loosen and nerve transmissions change this pro this produces a very calm and light feeling in the body you feel very still and somewhat divorced from the body this is a very pleasant state and at first your concentration is quite good nicely centered on the breath as it continues however the pleasant feelings intensify and they distract your attention from the breath. You start to really enjoy the state and your mindfulness goes way down. Your attention winds up scattered, drifting listlessly through vague clouds of bliss. The result is a very unmindful state, a sort of ecstatic stupor. The cure, of course, is mindfulness. Mindfully observe, this, uh, mindfully observe these phenomena and they will dissipate. A blissful feel when a blissful feeling arises oh excuse me when blissful feelings arise accept them there is no need to avoid them but don't get wrapped up in them they are physical feelings so treat them as such observe feelings as feelings observe dullness as dullness watch them rise and watch them pass don't get involved you will have problems in meditation everybody does you can treat them as terrible torments or as challenges to be overcome. If you regard them as burdens, your suffering will only increase. If you regard them as opportunities to learn and grow, your spiritual prospects are unlimited. So that was uh, dealing with problems. Um, and this is from pay. This is chapter 10. In Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana. And uh, this is page 97 to page 113. So uh, I hope to read more sections out of this book in the coming weeks. So please join me for uh more uh, readings on this book, Mindfulness in Plain English by Bhante Gunaratana. Uh, for now, this evening, uh, we uh, have just read the section on dealing with problems. So that is all I will be reading for this evening. But like I said, uh, I plan to do more readings on this book in coming weeks. So please join me for those readings. 
Thank you all for joining tonight, and I'll see you next time.